Today's text comes to us from Galatians chapter 5, starting with verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, this week, I really want you to, to think about and just do some personal reflection. And there's this tension that we talk about today between desires of the flesh and the Spirit, particularly the fruit of the Spirit, right? Now, if we're totally honest, I think all of us can see examples in our own life of that list of negative stuff, those desires of the flesh, right? We can think back to go, yeah, I can see some of those pieces in my life, or I can see all of those pieces in my life, or maybe just one really stands out glaringly to you. But all of us, if we're honest, because we're all fallen, broken human people, we all have that type of stuff living in our lives. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there are no law. There is no law. Now, it's important to note that these things are listed as fruit of the Spirit. They're not things that we generate inside of us. It's not something that we just need to try harder in our life to nurture and cultivate these things. They are given to us by the Holy Spirit. They are nurtured and watered and fed by the Holy Spirit. Now, while it is indeed the work of the Holy Spirit to grow this fruit in our lives, perhaps there is a bit of intentionality that we could increase in our daily walk to think about which of those fruit of the Spirit we would like to see more of or that we would like to intentionally be a part of experiencing, putting it into practice. Love. This is the agape-style, God-level, sacrificial, benevolent, always-seeking-good-for-others, selfless kind of love and joy. Is this abundant cheerfulness, this exuberant joy, exceedingly great joy that you hear about when, when the good news is shared? And peace. It's a quietness, a oneness, a wholeness. And patience. Patience isn't just being able to wait, but it's being able to wait during difficult circumstances or with difficult people. You wait and are patient. Kindness and goodness, very closely connected to each other, is this kind of demeanor or character of being gentle and kind and good, and then faithfulness. This ability to cling to the promises that Jesus makes, the promises of forgiveness and salvation that we rely on, that we base our lives on, that shape the focus and paradigm of everything that we encounter. And gentleness is a mildness, a humility, a meekness, not a weakness, but a meekness. And meek is this quiet, reserved strength and self-control temperance. Now, it's important to keep in mind that, as I said before, both of these, the desires of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, they both exist at the same time in the heart of every single believer. That's just how this works. There's this tension that we encounter. And in this tension, uh, it's not as if once you're baptized, like the four young ones were baptized today, it's not as if all those desires of the flesh just poof, just disappear, right? They just go away, and now we're just perfect and holy angels. I assure you, that's not how any of this works. Those 
fleshly desires still linger in our lives. Romans 7 comes to mind. The good that I would do, that I do not do. And the evil I do not want to do, that's what I keep on doing. You see, we have two sides to us now. When you come into faith, there's a side that, that loves to give into fleshly desires and the side that loves the fruit of the Spirit and its growth. See, we go back and forth between wanting to live for ourselves and wanting to live for God. And so this new fight shows up in our life. Before faith, we are at war with God. We're fighting against God. After faith, we're no longer fighting against God. We're fighting against our former selves. This is the fight that Paul calls fighting the good fight. Right? And when you fight the good fight, it's very, very different from fighting the old fight. When you're fighting the old fight, that fight against God, it wears you down, it exhausts you, it breaks you down, and you feel dry and worthless and humble and broken. But when you fight the good fight, letting the fruit of the Spirit be what you focus the growth on, you, you fight against your old self, and fighting in the sight of God, fighting against your old self, it builds you up, it encourages you, it equips you, it strengthens you. But still there's people who sit here in church and maybe there's just no fight in your life at all. Maybe that's you today. And sometimes that happens when we're not exposing ourselves regularly to the Holy Spirit to allow Him to do work in our lives because when you start doing things where the Holy Spirit engages with you and grows your faith and nurtures the fruit of the Spirit, the enemy takes notice. And he does everything in his power to slow you down or stop what you're doing. I guarantee you, if you were to say, I'm going to make a commitment to spend more time in God's Word, I'm going to read 10 minutes. And if you already read 10 minutes, say, I'm going to read 20. If you already read 20, say, I'm going to start reading and praying for half an hour. I'm going to commit to making this a part of what I want to do, not out of a checklist of things to do, but because I want to connect with the God who loves me, and I want to deepen that relationship. And if you make that commitment, I guarantee you, you're going to do good for like a couple days. And the enemy's going to throw all kinds of garbage at you to try to slow you down or convince you that you're too busy or think that you've got something else better to do or just, you're just hungry. Because he doesn't want that tension in your life. The enemy doesn't want you to have tension between the fleshly desires and the fruit of the Spirit. He just wants you to give it to the fleshly desires. And he knows that if you allow the Holy Spirit to grow and deepen that fruit inside of you, there will be tension and that's a tension, that good fight that we need to have in our lives. There's a, uh, there's a parable, a tale, a fable that's been told for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years within the, uh, the Native American population. And it's a tale of two wolves talking about these two natures that are inside of each of us. Uh, this is how it goes. One is evil. It is anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? And then they ask the question, which wolf wins? And the answer is simple. It's the one that you feed. See, when we feed our fleshly desires, those, those, those pieces of our past, they, all, they exist in every single one of us. Right? That's something I want you to think about. Each one of those 14 traits that were listed are seeds that are planted into each one of our lives since the fall, since our brokenness. We all have those. Now, it could be that not all of them are manifested in your life, right? But you have the seeds there. And then depending on what your environment is that you've, that you've lived, the people that you've connected to, the experiences and encounters that you've had in your life can all tend to make maybe one or two or four or ten of those grow and manifest in your life. And here's what that looks like. Right, if you grew up in a place where there were seeds of enmity and strife and jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions, and these were daily watered, not only in your home, but your places of work or school, 
then you might just grow up to be a violent, bitter, and angry person. If drunkenness seed was what got watered in your life by, by parents or grandparents or family members, then maybe, maybe drugs and alcohol is what you turn to to self-medicate. If envy was watered in your life, maybe you've turned into a person that just never quite feels good enough. Now, here's some good news. Because just like all 14 of those seeds are planted in our hearts from birth, those fruit of the Spirit have all been planted into each and every one of us through faith. For many of us, that first planting was at our baptisms when we were babies. And each one of those fruit of the Spirit seeds were planted inside of us. Not just one or two or three, but all of them are there just waiting to grow. Just waiting to grow. Well, how do we, how do we make that happen? How do we allow the Holy Spirit to grow that in our lives? Well, you have to be where the Holy Spirit is, right? Because it's not the work that we do. It's the work that God does to nurture that in our hearts. So how in the world do we expose ourselves to the Holy Spirit? We have to be where the Holy Spirit is. And I want to give you three clear places where you can find the Holy Spirit to work powerfully in your life. The first one is in worship gatherings, which you are doing right now. We've gathered together to hear God's Word, which the Holy Spirit promises to work through. We've witnessed the act of baptism, the sacrament of baptism, where the Holy Spirit has promised to infuse life and grace into these four children today. And we remember the promise of grace that He's infused into us through our baptisms. We receive the Lord's Supper, His body and blood given for the forgiveness of our sins. The Holy Spirit promises in Scripture to work through those to grow the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Being a part of regular worship isn't just something we do to please God. It's something God does to bless us. Think about that. You are not here today so that God will be happy with you. You are here today because God desires to bless you. Second place, besides worship gatherings, where we encounter the Holy Spirit is in spiritual formation. Right? Every time you crack open a Bible and you dig into those pages, you understand that this is not just a novel, this is not just a nonfiction book, this is a living, breathing word from God to you about his plan to restore and redeem your life. Every time you connect and engage with other believers in faith conversations, in Bible study, every time you engage in prayer, every time you connect with other people and together with God, spiritual formation, the Holy Spirit is in that process growing and nurturing your faith growing the fruit of the Spirit abundantly in your life. Worship gatherings, spiritual formations, and community connections. Anytime you start to say, I need to be a part of something that's bigger than me, I need to be a part of God's family, when you reach into and make relationships within this group of people here, when you reach out into the community and serve them with a generous life that seeks to pour out abundantly what God has poured into you, into those that you find that have need, the Holy Spirit is engaging your faith, putting it into action, working through you, and as He does, grows those fruit of the Spirit abundantly. Where do I go to be washed and overwhelmed by the water and the nutrients of the Holy Spirit? Is in worship, in spiritual formation, and in community. So incredibly important. And Paul tells us that we are to walk in the Spirit. And what that means is this, that we are to recognize that at both times, simultaneously, in our hearts, there are, there are seeds of desires of the flesh, and there are fruit of the Spirit, and they are in tension with each other all the time. And so what we need to do is in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, we need to constantly be thinking, is this a desire of the flesh, or is this a fruit of the Spirit? And if we identify something as a desire of the flesh, Paul says we need to crucify it. It's a harsh word. Right, but that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He was crucified in the flesh on the cross with all the passions and desires. Jesus was crucified that we would overcome, that we would be set free, that we would be forgiven and made new. 
And so for us, what this means, crucifying the flesh, for us, what this means is this, that we identify those desires of the flesh, that we spot them quicker and quicker in our lives, and as soon as we spot them, we confess them to God. And maybe we confess them to somebody else that we've harmed. To crucify in the flesh means that we begin to make some sometimes painful changes in our lives. That in order to experience behavior change and, and do more and more to be more and more Christ-like, it takes new roles that we take on in our life. It takes new relationships that we form. It takes doing new actions. And we invite somebody else in to that process and hold us accountable to those changes. We feed the right wolf. Let the Holy Spirit water and feed the fruit of the Spirit in your life. If we live by the Spirit, Paul says, we should also keep in step with the Spirit. To keep in step. This is a military term, to march in order, in rank, in file. Uh, something that I, I, I learned to really appreciate in high school. In middle school and high school, I was, I was in uh, marching band. I always wanted to be in football. <laughs> marching band. But I came to love it, and so much so that I became drum major my junior and senior year in high school, and I came to understand the perfection of keeping in step. Because as a marching band marches down the street in a parade, they must keep in step. Every stride has to be identical in length. Every knee has to come up to the perfect position so that it's a straight line all the way across. It's not that you've got hundreds of people walking together. When you keep in step, you are not multiple, you are one, working together in unity. And when you're out on the field and you're making formation, sometimes it looks chaotic and you don't quite see the picture until everything comes into focus exactly how it's supposed to be because you've kept in step. How amazing would it look to have a church that did just that? Right? We are many amazing individuals, unrepeatable miracles of God. But when we are unified by the mission of the church, walking in step with the Spirit of God, oh, baby, I can't wait to see it. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we praise you for being a God who Despite all of the fleshly desires in our life, you commit to growing the fruit of the Spirit in us. God, let your fruit grow abundantly. Challenge and stretch us to grow, Lord. Help us identify where we are moved by sinful motivations and, and, and move in us a desire and a hunger to no longer fight against you, but to fight against our former selves, to come into places of worship, to engage with conversations of faith, to build community, and in those places and spaces, let your Holy Spirit grow in us an abundant, abundant fruit. We pray this in Jesus' powerful and holy name. Amen. Now, it's our goal to help you with some of these faith conversations, and so every week we give you a weekly awakening. It's a statement or a question geared towards helping you initiate a conversation with another believer that you would be able to uh, let the Holy Spirit work in you and build up the fruit inside of you. This is this question for this week. What portion of the Spirit's fruit would you like to grow? Now, I know sometimes it's one of, it's one of those things where you're like, I'm not going to pray for patience because God's going to give me an opportunity to be patient. Be so bold. Be so bold. 